Roman, hi. Nice to meet you again. Um, Roman uh, has, did his doctoral degree at the Institute of Neuroinformatics at the University of Zurich and is currently a lecturer at the University of Computer Science or in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Surrey. His talk will be about computational methods in cryopreservation. Roman, please share your screen and uh, get ready. Thank you, Emil. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my presentation. First of all, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, having me here and for, of course, organizing this great event. Uh, for me personally, it's a little bit uh, unfortunate uh, to not have the meeting in Zurich, my birth city, actually. Uh, but of course, uh, online meetings have uh, many advantages too, and I'm looking forward to the meeting next year in Zurich. So in this presentation, I will talk about uh, some of the research we are doing in my lab uh, involving neural cryopreservation, uh, including also uh, usage of tool sets that are computational, so computational modeling. And um, I would like to start this uh, uh, talk by highlighting a, a very recently published paper. Uh, this was published actually this month, early, early in October. And in this paper, the authors have um, investigated uh, brain tissue from uh, a victim uh, that, that is more, almost 2,000 years um, uh, from, that was a victim uh, during a volcanic eruption almost 2,000 years ago. And, uh, and the authors ex essentially study and analyze brain tissue that was uh, vitrified in, during this eruption because of the ash that was very hot. And then afterwards, when it cooled down quickly, uh, some parts of the brain essentially got vitrified. <clears throat> and they analyzed uh, this brain tissue and uh, they could show essentially that the structure of the neurons, the axonal trees, uh, were well preserved. Uh, uh, here you see some electron image, uh, electron microscopy images, where even uh, detailed individual segments of axons were shown to be well preserved. And so, arguably, this is the the best preserved human neural tissue uh, in archaeology. Nevertheless, uh, because there was a lot of damage, I mean, these were usually small parts of the, of the brain uh, and cortex. Uh, nevertheless, uh, most people would agree with me. Uh, I think if, if, uh, if I state that uh, probably most of the memories and the information and the personality essentially, the, the information on the memories is not anymore present in this brain. And so one question that arises is, what are the aspects, what are the factors that are essential in order to preserve the information that is uh, in the brain? And uh, <clears throat> one crucial factor are uh, for sure synapses. So synapses are the connections between individual neurons. Uh, they are uh, involved in learning and, uh, and, and maintenance of memories. But then there are also other factors, like, for example, the distribution of receptors, which allow for neurotransmitters to impact on the electrical activity of neurons. Uh, we also know that glial cells play a huge role in, in neural function. So uh, there are actually more glial cells in the brain than there are neurons. And the interactions between glial cells and neurons have been shown to be very important. Uh, we also know uh, that excitability of neurons plays a big role. So a, a, a former student of mine, uh, Sarai Soldado Magraner, recently published some work where uh, the authors show that neurons change their excitability depending on their inputs. And uh, this, this can last for, uh, for a long time. And so this is also an essential feature of neural memories. And uh, another example is so-called ephaptic coupling. So this is actually a way for neurons to communicate without synapses. Uh, essentially, the neurons create electromagnetic fields that influence the activity of other neurons. And uh, also this has been shown to play a role in, in the workings of the brain. And so 
the point that I'm trying to make here is essentially that the, uh, the neural tissues uh, are extremely complex. They have uh, a lot of um, um, components that are important in, in the functioning of the brain. And it is currently yet an open question whether one can cry preserve uh, neural mammalian neural tissues while maintaining the information that is required for it to work. And so this is actually something, uh, or a question that we address in, in our research. And we particularly focus on the retina. So the retina is a neural tissue at the rear of the eye. And uh, it is a, a good, uh, good uh, place to, to essentially uh, focus on this research question because it's peripheral, so it's easy to access. So one can quite easily obtain uh, this tissue, uh, for example, from the mouse and do experiments with it. It's also interesting because uh, it is, um, it is uh, structurally quite similar to the cortex in, in, the, in the brain. So uh, the, the cortex also has multiple layers of different cell types and, and uh, the, the, the structure of the retina is quite similar to it. And, and also the one big advantage of the retina is that one can essentially measure the electrical activity of the retina quite easily using, for instance, so-called multi-electrode arrays. So multi-electrode arrays uh, allow to measure spikes in the in the retina and so they can essentially allow to see if the retina is functional whether it works uh, well or not <clears throat> and uh, we have uh, recently actually published uh, some work where we study the retina and how it changes during development in, in the human uh, species and uh, there are many uh, uses of this so if one could cry preserve the retina uh, then there would be many uh, uses of this. For instance, uh, pharmaceutical research would benefit from this because if one cry, can cryopreserve uh, retinal tissue, then uh, one can essentially ba bank a large number of, of tissues and uh, do uh, drug testing with those. Um, uh, currently, one is quite uh, restrained by, by the, the need to, to do these experiments very quickly. But if one could cry preserve them, then one could essentially scale up pharmaceutical research with neural tissues. And also for, uh, for generally for biobanking, this would be good. So one could transplant certain parts of, of tissues and, and uh, ultimately, of course, uh, also cr brain cryopreservation uh, would benefit uh, from insights gained by cryopreserving the retina. So my postdoc, uh, Dr. Sanja Bojic, um, has been looking from an experimental point of view into the cryopreservation of the retina. And uh, she has done a lot of uh, hard and, and great work. Uh, she has looked uh, at the retina, at the quality of the anatomy of the retina after using different kinds of cryopreservation protocols. So uh, we tested a large number of different ways of how one cryopreserves tissues. And uh, here you, you see an example of a, of a mouse retina where different colors indicate different cell types in the retina. And, and also you here see uh, um, essentially the layered structure of the retina is very well preserved. And uh, so this is one example of how one can assess essentially whether the retinal structure is well preserved after thawing. Uh, this is, these are some other examples that uh, Sanya uh, made uh, using other techniques. This is a so-called H and E stain, where uh, again, one can see that the, 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 the structure of the layers uh, in the control case. So the control case is the non cry preserved uh, case. And here in the experimental case where we uh, cool down to very low temperatures, uh, you can see that after thawing, the, we can still obtain a quite good structure, anatomical structure. And also then we looked in great detail using um, electron microscopy images uh, at uh, those tissues. And again, uh, also here, the, I think this is quite promising. Uh, anatomically speaking, this looks very good. Um, uh, but of course, this is not yet uh, a proof that, uh, that it works uh, uh, very well. Uh, we have to uh, do some further experiments. In particular, we would like to, as I mentioned before, to look at electrical activity and, and, and check, do the, those retinas that were frozen and thawed, 
do they still give rise to similar activity patterns as we had before? Because that will be essentially a proof that the whole architecture and the whole integrity and quality of the tissue is high. Which actually brings me to, 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 to an important point, uh, which is that cryopreservation is very complex. So if one wants to cryopreserve tissues, one needs to first cool it down, of course, and there are different ways of how one cools it down. One can use, for example, different cooling rates. One can cool it very quickly or slowly. One can use different kinds of cryoprotective agents and different concentrations of those cryoprotective agents. And uh, also for the thawing, one has a similar uh, challenge as for the cooling. How do you uh, determine the optimal way of thawing? And uh, this is really a, a complex problem because for instance, if one uses high concentrations of cryoprotective agents, then one uh, of course reduces the injury from freezing, but one increases the toxicity. So those agents uh, are often very, very toxic. And so one has to find a trade-off. And currently this is done mainly based on a trial and error basis. And what we thought is why not bring in uh, a, a, a kind of integrated computational approach that allows to computationally model what is going on as a, exactly in the tissue during cooling and during thawing in order to better optimize those cryopreservation protocols. And uh, a few years ago, I actually started uh, a collaboration with uh, CERN and, uh, and other institutions. So it has grown uh, significantly since uh, the start. And we have uh, now created uh, the Biodynamo project. And um, if you're interested, you can go to the website. We have uh, created a code, a software that is open source and that allows to simulate uh, different kinds of biological tissues. So complex biological tissues, including like cancers or, or neural tissues. And, uh, and we, we decided in this project to, uh, to essentially use Biodynamo for cryopreservation. So uh, my PhD student, Jack, uh, is working on uh, extending Biodynamo in order to, to simulate how temperature dynamics affect tissues and, and multicellular systems. And uh, this package, which is called Cryodynamo, and which we are currently uh, finalizing, allows to essentially simulate what is going on during the whole process? How are cells dehydrating during the process of cryopreservation? How are they, uh, th their uh, mechanical uh, properties changing? And here you see an example of this. Uh, so here you see how the concentration of water changes over time during a de decrease of the temperature. So you can see that the color becomes uh, lower and, and we have a 3D dimension, dimensionality here. So we can really model at different spatial um, coordinates how things uh, change dynamically. Um, so this has many applications. Uh, for instance, uh, one application that we looked into is for the optimization of, of cryopreservation of umbilical cord blood. So uh, uh, it is known that the volume of the, the, the samples that one cryopreserves um, has an impact on when ice crystals form. So ice nucleation is, or the ice nucleation temperature is essentially when ice crystals start forming. And we could simulate with cryodynamo quite well in agreement with experimental measurements when this happens, depending on the volume of the sample that we're looking at. And uh, based on this kind of modeling approach, one can therefore optimize uh, and, and, and improve the quality of such samples. And uh, this is just one example of, of, uh, of an application of cryodynamo. Uh, then also we, we looked into uh, the cooling rate optimization. So it is known, for instance, from experimental uh, work that different cooling rates uh, affect the quality of the cells after cryopreservation. So in this case, uh, jurcat cells had the best uh, quality uh, at, a, at a, about 2.5, at the cooling rate of about 2.5 degrees Celsius per minute. And um, uh, we could essentially, without having to, rep to, to, to do, do a lot of experimental work, 
we could create this similar curve, which allows to optimize the cooling rates just computationally. And so you can see this, this value of using computational techniques that help people in practice to optimize cryopreservation. And of course, ultimately, we would like to, to apply this also for neural tissue cryopreservation and combine this with all the results we are now collecting uh, with uh, Sanya's great work. So I want to uh, summarize that, that I think the retina is a great uh, uh, tissue to look at if one wants to better understand how cortical tissue and brain tissue uh, in cortex is essentially where higher order thinking happens, where planning happens. And by looking at the retina and how it behaves during cryopreservation, we can good, uh, get a much better idea of how cryopreservation affects the brain and, and cortex in particular. Uh, and then we have made some important steps in this direction, uh, but we, we need to do more. We need to know better uh, how is exactly the structure affected. How are those different factors that I mentioned at the beginning? How do they uh, change uh, with cryopreservation? Because only that will allow us to really say whether it works or not, whether the, the whole, uh, the, the, the information that is contained in the, in the tissue really uh, is preserved with a good quality. And uh, so we need to do more research there for sure. Um, we have done some important steps towards a computational framework that can help uh, uh, people that do experiments to, to guide their protocols, to, to be able to better know what kind of parameters they should choose. And uh, I think this also uh, shows uh, more and more how modern computational approaches um, can help uh, biomedical research and, and cryopreservation research in the future. So what I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, of course. Uh, there are too many to, to all include in a slide, but uh, there have been, uh, this, this research is the product of, of a wide range of uh, people that were involved in one way or another. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Roman, great talk. Thanks a lot. There are a few questions from the audience. And since we have like two, three, four minutes, um, I would run through a few, right? So first question is, could it ever be possible in the future to, to recover, not the consciousness, but at least some memory fragments from partially uh, vitrified brains of long dead people? Um, like persons from before for AD, like the, the, the example is AD 79. Right, so from based on this paper, uh, I'm not an expert in archaeological uh, data, of right. course, uh, but, but based, on, based on this data that I presented, uh, that I showed uh, at the very beginning from this study that was published this, this October, uh, I think the volumes were that were preserved were really too small. I think mm -hmm. in these cases, I think there's not in enough information to have a meaningful representation of of complex memories maintained, which because right. memories are are also stored in the brain in a very distributed fashion, uh -huh. so we will need to have information from different parts of the brain. And I think in this case, this uh, is probably there is too much injury. I think. Right. Um, I actually have a good amount of more questions, so I'm running through a few. Um, is it, it so? Someone's it was someone's understanding that uh, retinal tissue can already be regularly cryopreserved and is uh, is viable. Uh, what's your what's your opinion on that? Well, that's it. it depends. So re if it's immature, that's true. So uh, there are papers, uh, about two or three papers, that show that immature retinal tissue can be cryopreserved. But as soon as you uh, mature them, then you have serious problems. I mean, I work with uh, people that grow retinal tissue from human embryonic stem cells and. And uh, currently, it's not really possible to preserve in the long term uh, those tissues. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, then the next one is, um, how close, in your opinion, are we um, for using these advances to help preserve donated human organs? Yes, so that's, that's a good question. I mean, this is, uh, of course, uh, ongoing research. I think uh, it, will take, it will take time uh, in order to scale up uh, those techniques and uh, approaches, uh, I, I, I could not give a 
a clear time frame. I think, especially now, uh, also because of the economic situations, I think this will this will slow down. I think research uh, generally uh, for many for many types of of research. So uh, I think if things go very well, we, we might be able uh, to, to to achieve good success for for certain types of volumes because that's one of the big bottlenecks. There is the volume, of course. And uh, so I think this will take some time. And I hope, of course, I very much hope that there will be funding available to do this direction of research. Yeah. Perfect. And then due to time, the last question, unfortunately, which is also very highly voted. Um, the approach using cryodynamo is fascinating. How did you obtain the experimental data linking simulation parameters, temperature and osmolarity to cell viability? Uh, so, so there are, we essentially have two different uh, types of data. One is the published data. So one of them I, I uh, cited in, in my presentation just now uh, where we looked at Jurkat cells. Mm -hmm. So th there is data out there in the public space. And then also we are using currently data that we're collecting uh, in our lab. Uh, Sanya is, is, uh, has done some great work and we have already collected some, some nice data that will help inform this data. Uh, the, the modeling, but of course we need more uh, data. You can never have enough uh, data as a computational biologist. So if you right. have data that you might you think would be interesting to use for such a computational approach to inform, please get in touch. We would be very very interested to to look into this. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Roman. See you later at Thank the Q and A.